How do you do that? That's the question. How do you become better? How do you constantly build your capacity as a creative so that you have more value to offer? So those three C's I think is very important. Clarity, connectedness and capacity. Welcome everybody. Welcome back to the show. My name is Maynard as always. And um, on this channel, at least, we talk about how as creative professionals out in the world, we can build a career that is meaningful, where we can make an impact, generate an income, and just do the work that matters to us and is special to us. Today, I am super privileged and I have the pleasure to have with us on the show, uh, old friend and colleague of mine, Herman Duplessis. Herman is the founder and managing director currently of the Temba Tandeka Leadership Institute, or TTLI, if you will. Um, and I'll share everything below. She'll be able to click and see what Herman is busy with and how his work is going. Herman has written and published a book quite recently in his field of expertise called Lead with Intent. It's all about the nine principles and the practices for engagement and profitability. And we're going to be talking about that a lot with Herman today. He has been working extensively with teams in all sectors and industries, especially helping them to engage with and implement not just the principles in the book, but also as part of his 20 years of expert leadership experience, whether it's in coaching, mentoring, strategic training, um, consulting in various spheres of leadership development. Uh, when it comes to Herman and myself, Herman and I met when we were both working at and with a church in Johannesburg, Mosaic, and what immediately struck me about Herman, and I'm sure you'll pick up on this in the next half an hour or so when we, when we talk, was his, not just his deep wisdom, but also his way of communicating it in a direct and kind and compassionate approach, which for me does not just make Herman an excellent leader, but just a stellar human being. So Herman, Welcome on the show. I'm super glad to have you. Thank you for saying yes and spending some time with us. Thank you, Maynard. I'm, I'm grateful I finally made the cut to be on your show. <laughs> no, of course. You, you always made the cut. I was looking forward. I was telling you before the time that um, I, I invited you with selfish intent because I've always enjoyed our conversations. And, um, and now that you are a professional coach and leadership consultant, as you should be, as always should have been. Mm -hmm. I, I think that this half an hour is going to be just of so much value, not just to the audience outside, but to me as well. So thank you so much. Thanks for being here. No, no thank you. Your introduction wanted... was very kind. I appreciate that. <laughs> and true though. <laughs> I wanted to I wanted to kick off, you know, part of the um part of the creative effort is to is to find your voice and figure out what it is that you're supposed to do in the in the world. For most of us in the creative world, for those of us that make things that make change out in the world, there isn't a clear pathway. It's not a career um there isn't a career trajectory set out for most of us, most of the people that make meaningful change in the world. And um and and so it has been with you. And you literally just told me a moment ago about how you had a very pivotal conversation with your significant other, with your wife, about that moment for you. And how how making that decision that one time in your life led to just a bunch of things falling into place where you have now written the book and you're doing all this um work in the world up to this point where we are chatting on the podcast here this afternoon. But won't you just talk us a little bit? about what went into that decision when you had to make that difficult choice uh, about the work that you're supposed to do in the world? Yeah, so I was working for an organization, quite a large organization, and I was um, at a young age quite uh, in a senior position. And I think I was begging for more opportunity to express myself, uh, to use my talents and my gifts. And, um, you know, at the age of 27, I went into a performance management discussion and I mean, I had great praise and, and they told me that I have great potential and I was super excited. And a year later, I went into the same conversation, begging for more opportunities. And I heard, you know, I, I, I have great potential. And then <laughs> third year, the same thing happened. Uh, and <laughs> at that time, I was actually reading a book by Owen McManus, who you would know very well. And the book mm. was called Chasing Daylight. And it said something like this, you know, if you're 20 and someone looks at you and says you have potential, uh, you know, that's great. If you're 30, somebody says that about you, that's great. But if you're 40 and somebody says you have so much potential, pause, step into a closet and have a good cry. What once was a statement of promise is now an assessment of lost opportunity. And I just yeah. thought, you know, that uh, 
it's 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 lost opportunity for me. I I need to do something about this. It's my responsibility. It's my life. And um, you know, typically I was complaining to my wife about that. She's very pragmatic and said, "Well, you know, just resign. I back you. You know, do do what you feel you need to do." And um, you know, fortunately, my wife earned well. Uh, you know, at the time because uh, she's a chartered accountant, so. That really, you know, I think created the space for me to go out on my own and and start start this consultancy, which was, uh, I think, a, a very pivotal moment uh, in in my life. Mm. That makes um, that makes hundred percent sense, and uh, and so, and it's not always easy to take those decisions and to go from being to having potential to becoming potent. It takes courage, right? Yeah. I mean, how was it for you? <laughs> Yeah. Look, I think um, it, it, in a way it felt arrogant uh, to think that, you know, I can do this and I can do it on my own. I don't need anybody else. But I think, you know, you, you need a bit of uh, um, a bravado if you step out and do something like that. You need to believe in yourself. And uh, I think you need one other person to believe in you, which was my significant other, my wife. Uh, but I think there was a lot of anxiety, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of risk mm. involved. I mean, um, but I think what what really worked for me was the relationships I had and, you know, working those relationships, uh, going to people, asking them. I remember I had a good friend who was a CEO of one of the Virgin companies back then. And mm. he actually said, you know, I'll back you. Come and work in my company. Uh, what is it? And that was like my first biggest big contract was with him. And then I also branched out with a psychologist. And I think the two of us worked very well together uh, in writing and developing workshops. But initially, mm. it was scary. I mean, the first month, I didn't even know how to draw up invoices. So, um, you know, obviously, my wife being a chartered accountant had to help me with all of that. You know, what does an invoice look like? <laughs> so after the first month, I did a lot of work. And then I thought, oh, my gosh, I need to invoice. How do I do this? <laughs> Oh my goodness! Yeah. All right. I, I I like what you're saying about um about stepping out with confidence, but doing so within the context of a supportive network of relationships mm -hmm. and how those two things kind of balance each other out. I think for those of us uh, who are listening, just give us a quick tour over the course of your career. You can start wherever you want and you can uh, mm. finish wherever you want, but just give us an idea. How did it play out for you over the course of your professional journey? And, um, and what were yeah. some of the key moments? And, um, and then maybe end with what you're up to now, what you're doing, whether it's with a book or the Institute. Mm. Um, just give us a short overview. Yeah. So, I mean, very quickly, after varsity, I, I taught uh, I taught for two years as a school teacher. Um, mm. And um, in that time, I got approached by a church to come and work for them. So I studied theology part-time after doing a BCom, then finished my theology, and then um, worked at that church for about, I'd say, 10 years. Then started the the institute uh, on my own, uh, and that you know I think as a thirty year old starting the institute, I really, I think I really struggled to show people my worth, because how do you coach executives in their forties and fifties if you're a thirty year old? That was quite a struggle for me, so I took hands with an Australian university, Monash University. Now, once again, nobody is a self-made man. And I got into this university through my wife, who was working there at the time. And I teamed up with their business school. And I had this idea of coaching people, but after coaching them, actually giving them a postgraduate certificate in leadership and management coaching. So I pitched that idea because I thought that, is, that was a way of distinguishing me from any other coaches out there. Because when I started out as a coach, you know, every every ex-psychologist, industrial psychologist, school counselor, everybody called themselves a coach in those days. And it was quite difficult to, you know, to get a foot into the market. So that helped me a lot. So I uh, built the business with them uh, and then got a, got a major contract with the biggest uh, bank on the African continent 
worked with them in 18 different countries across Africa, which was incredible. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, I think uh, signed a, a lot of other clients uh, and I think developed over 100 plus different leadership products, which is incredible. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's, it's incredible how much content you can create uh, over a long period of time. I think, you know, we, we overestimate what we can do in one year and we underestimate what we can do in 20 years, you know. So, exactly. I mean, just uh, it's, it's incredible how many courses we, we, we've developed. And then, um, you know, uh, as you would know, I made a detour back into the, the church environment part time, helping out but still kept the mm -hmm. business going. And by then I had employed enough people to, to do most of the work for me. Also sold 50% of the business. Actually, we sold 50% of my wife's shares. We sold to an investor in the business. And um, then after five years working part-time ministry, part-time in the business, uh, when COVID came, I actually went back into the business, which was a very good move because that gave me the time to eventually write the book. Mm. Now, um, I think the big reason we, we, we wrote the book is we, we unearthed uh, an engagement methodology uh, coupled with leadership that leads to engagement. So when we worked in this uh, massive South African bank, the, the first division they gave us was a division that really struggled with engagement. And the executive came to me and actually said, Armand, if we don't fix engagement here, we'll most probably be outsourced in the next two years. So, you know, we, we, we got to work and I'm, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. We, you know, we, we just looked at what the problems were and we, we tried to add value and solve problems immediately. And uh, within the first two years, we took the engagement levels from 4% to over 40%. Wow. And they were very chuffed with that, and they extended our contract, and we still have a contract with them today. Today, their engagement mm. levels are at 93%, which is far no beyond way. world class. So, yeah. so when we got those results, they actually asked us to duplicate the same in this business division across Africa. So what we have in the book is, um, uh, 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 and by the way, then then this bank came to us and said, exactly what did you do? And we said, well, we didn't, we don't know. And the reality is, we had to reverse engineer everything we did. So that's when we embarked on a on an eighteen month research project to figure out exactly what did we do that worked. So we interviewed executive, senior managers, middle and junior managers one on one, and supervisory level and down in the organization we interviewed. Um, in groups, and we came up with nine dimensions of engagement that I discuss in the book. And the first dimension is leadership, and the book's about the nine leadership principles and practices. So I think mm -hmm. looking forward now, um, I mean, we, we're very busy rolling out engagement solutions for customers. I think what's great is it's been researched in 18 African countries. So it's it's basically, I think, the only African model for engagement that I know of, but we've benchmarked it against the big guys, you know, the Gallups, Deloitte's, mm. McKinsey's, PWC's. I think we have the most comprehensive model, and obviously it's subjective, but I mean, I've looked at the other models. I think uh, what we offer is a lot more comprehensive, and um, it's a lot more customized than, than international mm. solutions. So we're very excited about it. I think more and more companies are signing on. And I mean, I don't want to brag about the results, but the results are spectacular, you know, um, nice. if I can give you a short and witty answer. <laughs> <laughs> and I so, I so love that you actually went out and did this because, um, I mean, there are these stalwarts of leadership who have created content for us to learn from and we stand on their shoulders, but we are living in a different world. We're not living in the Brand Pretoria's, mm -hmm. John MacArthur worlds anymore. And, um, yeah. and there are new technologies to contend with and new generations to engage with. So I think mm -hmm. in your opinion, without giving away everything that's, that's in your book, I'm, I'm going to encourage everybody to go and read it and, um, by the way, I think the book's also available on the book platform. We had on the show Louis Neil Corson just a couple of weeks ago, mm. and he shared with us everything about that. So we'll share the book link and all the other places where people can engage with your work. But for now, if you had to just put your finger on in, in, 
in October of 2023, for people who are either in a leadership position or they're leading without a title or they're working by themselves, what do you think is like the key differentiator? If you had to pick one, the key differentiator between somebody who's got a natural leadership quality of ability, who is taking lead, whatever you want to call it, and somebody that's not. I mean, what is the difference and what is that one leadership thing to aspire to if we want to make the places where we work and live and be uh, better and more productive? Mm. So leaders, they attract responsibility. Uh, that's mm. what it's about, you know. Um, leadership is responsibility. There's, there's no other way to put it, you know. Uh, if, I, if I can bring in my Christian faith here, Paul writes in Romans 12, verse 8, that if you have the gift of leadership, you should lead with diligence. And um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's absolute focus. That's why the book is called Lead with Intent, because leadership is highly mm. intentional. It's something you do every single day to get results. It doesn't happen by accident. The leaders we worked with and that we researched with who build teams that are highly engaged, you know, these are the practices. And, and, and I mean, I feel like an imposter because I wrote the book, but I got these principles from leaders who practice these principles every single day. So it's actually not my wisdom. It's, it's the wisdom of 600 leaders out there across 18 African countries who are just incredible at what they do. And even though they sit in this highly bureaucratic environment, they, they find a way to keep all constituencies happy with their leadership. Mm. And I mean, that's one of the biggest struggles is, is how do you do that? How do you keep customers happy? You keep employees happy and you keep shareholders happy. That's a very difficult task. And, mm. um, and we believe these principles help leaders to do that. But to come back to your question, Maynard, I would say, Leaders love responsibility. They just love it. They, 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 they want to be the ones that make the difference. Um, and 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 what's funny is the, the leadership we unearthed is a new generation leadership. It's a leadership that has high levels of humility. You know, mm. uh, really high levels of humility. Um, I, I read a global study two weeks ago. The biggest impediment to effective leadership, 68% uh, uh, of the respondents said the personal ego. And, um, yeah. and what I find with the younger generation leaders, for them, it's not about them. It's really about, I want my life to make a difference. That's why I take on this responsibility, because I want to see my labor make a difference in other people's lives. It's not about me. So they also do it behind the scenes. You know, It's not as if they walk out in front of people and 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 um, and try and inspire them it's they they unlock potential behind the scenes and they allow people to flourish mm. i like that idea i i de i deeply resonate with um with what you've said about um let me just see i made a note here about about leaders that attract responsibility that for me is so super profound because i see with the teams that we work with i work in a creative communication agency and we work with a myriad of clients through all kinds of industries and sectors and and sometimes the easiest thing to do is to just do what is already decided to be done or or to do what is what you're told to do that is the easy part but it's almost as if the leader or the person that's making the difference is actually the person that's figuring out what what should we even do? What is the thing that should be done? And they kind of attract, and it doesn't matter if they're 18 or 80 years old. I see this across the board. It's those people that think for themselves, what is it that we should do that are actually solving the problem, not just implementing the solution? And um, so yeah. I really I really like that. And the fact that it's intentional yeah. as well, that it's a daily thing. You have to lean into that posture on a daily level. Yeah. And I mean, uh, that's why we called the book Lead with Intent, because when we looked at these principles and we listened to how these leaders practice them, um, they see that as their job every day. You know, I teach many leadership courses and then usually people will tell me, Herman, I'm so busy. Now you want me to do all of this thing, all of these things as well. The reality yeah. is that's your job. The, yeah. the things I speak about, that's the job 
of a leader. The other stuff is business management. This is leadership. And these guys found a way to, with, with their management responsibilities, they also apply these leadership principles and practices. And it makes a mm. profound impact. It really does. I really, I really like what you're saying about this. This is actually your job. I, I was in a conversation not so long ago also about somebody that said that, but I have to do all of this and all of this. And now you want me to also now think about this and these things. Uh, just leave me be so that I can focus on what I'm good at. I think that was the actual words. I hope they're not watching the episode, but, and then I also thought to myself, and now I should have said it now that I'm listening to you. I, sh I should have said this out loud, but I didn't. I just think it to, I just thought it to myself. What do you think you're getting paid for? That is yeah. your job. It is your job to worry about these things, to own the solution, to display that intent and that responsibility and that radical ownership to move this thing towards um, being a solution. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. I am. Um, thanks for that. I'm super interested in uh, probably not what everybody else might ask you on interviews, but I'm interested in your own personal creative effort in writing the book. I understand it was a collective effort. It's based on research. But at some point, I assume mm -hmm. you had to go sit down and just spend some time and actually make something from scratch. Was that hard? Mm -hmm. Was it difficult? Did it, did it come easy? Was it a natural process for you? I also heard that you said it took about 18 months. How, how did you manage to, to commit to 18 months of consistent creative output? Uh, talk to us mm -hmm. a little bit about that. So what I did is I, um, as we unearthed the principles, I, I wrote articles about each one of them. So I wrote about the principle, how to practice the principle, and then what is the impact on the culture of the organization. And then I added a case study. So that's how I wrote the book. I took principle by principle, firstly wrote an article. So the first principle is humility. Um, discussed humility. How do you practice humility? Uh, what we found is leaders who are humble are vulnerable. They prepared to say, I'm wrong, I'm sorry. So I wrote about vulnerability. The impact on culture then is high levels of trust because if the leader can own up with vulnerability, everybody else is allowed to do it. And then finally, I would add a case study to that with one of the leadership teams we've worked with. So what I first did is I wrote articles and they were quite short, you know, and then um during COVID, I took those articles and I actually put them together. I expanded on it and then I wrote two chapters as an introduction to explain the philosophy and the thinking behind it, but also put the model in the book to publish the model so that the IP is ours, which I think was mm. important uh, because we started using the engagement model with the analysis we do for companies and we just wanted it to get published so that it's out there and that the IP is ours. So the 18-month mm. process was writing articles firstly and then putting them together in a book and then, I mean, the, 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 the most painful part is handing your book to an editor, which is soul destroying. <laughs> oh my goodness. They pull it apart. The, the, the meanest people on earth are book editors. <laughs> oh, bless their souls. But yeah, you're right. <laughs> but we need them. Okay. I mean, if uh, I'm an Afrikaans guy writing in English, so you can just imagine, uh, you know, I think, I think it was about nine rounds of editing, which was quite painful. What I quite, uh, in, I can, I can deeply associate with what you're saying, but what I quite enjoy nowadays is I read, um, a wise friend of mine said that now that, uh, in terms of general content, you've got large language models that can write things for you. And now guess what? You have become the editor. So one of my favorite pastimes <laughs> is to, to distill, uh, to attract like large pieces of text from my favorite AI text copy generator and then pull it apart and tell the AI model what they did wrong. And I feel I get a little bit of my own <laughs> revenge back. Revenge. So, so, yes. So I think um, we, we talked about this a little bit earlier. It's, it's super encouraging to hear about how your creative process has got structure in it. You went about it systematically. But I mean, at the heart, uh, and I assume, I mean, this is actually my question, is was this true for you? Because it, and I know it's true for me, and I know it's true for many other creative professionals. No matter how senior you are, no matter how much you've accomplished in this world, this always stays true. It's, there's always this creative angst. 
uh, this insecurity that we can never escape from, this dark place that always tells us you're not enough, you're an imposter. So when putting all of this out into the world, going through this creative process, do you still deal with creative anxiety or any anxiety for that matter? What's your opinion on it? Do you have advice for the rest of us? Let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So I, I read a book, um, I think it was about 2019. The book was called Managing Leadership Anxiety. Um, and the guy's called Steve Cuss. And it was a really profound book. And since then, I've been a big follower of Steve. And here's what I learned from Steve. So once again, this is not my wisdom. This is something I learned from him. But it's been, uh, it had a huge impact in my life. He, he asked the question, what's the opposite of anxiety? And most people would guess it's peace, it's harmony, it's tranquility, whatever you want to call it, mindfulness. But he reckons it's curiosity. And it was quite controversial, but then he explained himself. He said they, they, they did a, a, a sociological study where they put a mother and a baby in a room. And the mother sat on the chair and the baby uh, crawled around her uh, sitting on the chair. And then the baby would touch her, and then the baby would crawl around in the room, exploring high levels of curiosity, engaging with things on the floor. And every now and then the baby would crawl back, touch base with the mom, and then go back and, and, and look around in the room and just be curious. And then what they did is once the baby was busy exploring, they took the mom out of the room. And the baby looked back at the chair, couldn't see the mom. And the baby went back to the chair, held on to the chair, and high levels of anxiety just started crying. Hmm. And I think we all need that anchor in our lives to deal with anxiety. I mean, what is your worth based on? I mean, ultimately, that's the question. Now, for me, a great help in that field has been my faith. And there was hmm. a, a, a Dutch psychologist by the name of Henry Nouwen. And he wrote a beautiful book called God's Beloved, Adam, God's Beloved. And, um, and he talks about the identity um, of individuals. Because I think if, if, you, if you find your worth in who you are and not what you produce, it helps you to produce great content. But I think if your worth is in the content you produce, that creates a lot of anxiety for creative people. So mm -hmm. what I do every morning when I drop my daughter off at school, I say the following. I say, Grace, mom and dad is extremely glad that you are here. And we believe this world is a better place because you are here. And that's enough. And we try and, and instill an identity in her that she has value. And, and not what she does has value. Mm -hmm. So I think that's very mm -hmm. important it, is what is your anchor? For me, it's my faith. Uh, my identity as a, as a child of God is, is extremely important. Uh, I think if I lose that, I would suffer from much higher levels of anxiety. But ultimately believing I'm a child of God, he's looking out for me, um, he, he has given me these gifts, these talents, and I try and use it to make the world a better place. But ultimately, my worth is not um, in, in what I produce. It's in who I am. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, um, I love that. I, I'm reminded of a story that Elizabeth Gilbert, who wrote, she wrote Eat, Pray, Love like eons ago. And, yeah. uh, and she, she recounts a story where she was at a book signing um, of that actual book. And by that time, she was 27, 28 years old. Um, and somebody came up to her and asked her, how does it feel? And she said, what do you mean? And they said, how does it feel to know that at 27, 28, your biggest success is already behind you? And it, and she said it took her about five years to recover from that statement, <laughs> just to know that I will probably never be as successful as I was. And it all has to do with that, that idea that, um, my identity, my worth is tied up as a creative person in what I make, not in who I am. And so yeah. I just love what you're saying that at some point we all have to realize, hopefully most of us sooner rather than later, that 
our worth does not come from what it is that we put out into the world. We just worthy mm. by ourselves. We are. And if you can connect yeah. that to a deeper anchor, like your faith or whatever it is to you, um, that is super useful. All right. Yeah. I really appreciate that. Thank you. I have, um, I have one, I have actually two more things to ask you before we wrap this up. I think the one is a little bit, um, might, might be perceived a little bit more on the negative side. And then the other one will end on a high note, but nobody goes through making things that actually makes a difference in the world at the scale of what the book has been and what the Institute is doing, just what your work is accomplishing without running into one or two challenges or disappointments or heartbreaks. And so if you care to share with us, have what have some of those been on your journey? How did you process those? Are you still dealing with some of those? And then how, how do you survive or transcend deep disappointments on the creative journey to go on, pick yourself up and still do the work? Mm. So, I mean, um... I've most probably been rejected over a thousand times, you know, and and maybe and maybe in 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 twenty years of doing what I'm doing now, I've I've been said yes to uh, about ten times, which was great for the business. So the success mm -hmm. is 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 in is in in hustling and and never stopping. Um, I think mm -hmm. my biggest challenge and the challenge for the business is we're a boutique firm. So we're small. And if you work with big corporates, you will know this, that leaders in corporate environment, they don't manage and think what's best for the business. They manage and think what's best for my reputation. Mm. So we lose many business deals on a weekly basis to the big consulting houses, McKinsey, Deloitte, PwC, Kearney all the big consulting houses, because what executives think when they make decisions is they think, well, if this doesn't work out, I'm going to use somebody like PwC. Because then, mm. then I can at least say, hey, I used the best. But if I use TTLI and it doesn't work out, people are going to say, you're crazy for using this small boutique firm. Why would you ever do something like that? So I think a, yes. a big challenge is, for me was, was, was dealing with that. Um, showing success stories in the corporate environment, building the reputation. You know, I've, I've been in many meetings, uh, many, I can't even count, where people are ex super excited and you never hear from them again. And you follow mm -hmm. up with WhatsApp, email, you call them, they just flat out ignore you because they rather go with the big established consulting houses. And like I said earlier, even though I think our products are better, uh, they're more flexible and we can contextualize them better than the big consulting houses. We, I mean, we still, we lose 90% of the deals we pitch for, we lose. So that's a mm. big, big struggle for us. Um, but, you know, you have to work your networks. You have to build relationships. Most of the customers we get, we keep, which is great. Um, mm. and, and, and that's what it's about. So once you bring a customer into your firm, how do you take care of them? Uh, is is crucial you know uh, getting the deal is is a small part of of what follows and i think that's very important to realize but i just think you know rejection has been really tough you know i've i've been despondent so many times uh, you know uh, I, I went through a phase where i was looking for work overseas i was so hurtful but um you know it's just it's it's one of those things you know you uh, rejection is just part of the deal yeah, I get it. Well, thanks for sharing that. I, I think my final question to you is, um, is if you, if you had to imagine a creative professional person in, uh, whether they, whether they're in a leadership capacity or not, that are working on their career, they're doing their best and they're trying to make it work, either building their business or working in somebody else's company. If you had to spend half an hour or an hour with somebody like that, um, what would be your advice to that person, whether it has to do with the creative effort or with leadership or just with life in general mm. in South Africa, where we're living now? What is it that you tell young people that are starting out their careers? So 
the value we bring to people's lives are three things, and I believe in these three things. And once again, they weren't unearthed by me. It's actually unearthed by one of my colleagues. So I'm stealing his IP here. But but this is so important. Firstly, you need clarity. You don't need certainty. It's impossible mm. to have certainty in life today. So it's all about clarity. Understand what it is that you need to do. You you can't you can't focus on the what ifs. You've got to get clarity. Secondly, you have to be connected. And I think a lot of mm. creatives isolate themselves. So find a way to stay connected to get input from other people. And lastly, continually build capacity. Mm. How do you do that? That's the question. How do you become better? How do you constantly build your capacity as a creative so that you have more value to offer? So those three C's, I think, is very important. Clarity, connectedness, and capacity. Mm. I, I, um, I identify with that. I've, I've been, while you were speaking, I've been thinking about through each of those for my own life. And there's definitely something that I could do, as I'm sure everybody can do, in gaining more clarity being more kind of meaningfully connected. Um, in fact, mm. I love the fact that that has actually been the golden thread throughout our conversation, um, book ending it with the conversation you had with your wife as she supported you right at the beginning, throughout everything mm. now, talking about connection right at the end, and then finally having the capacity and the ability to actually do the things that we're supposed to in the world. Herman, this has been such a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks for sharing and... Um, Congratulations on the book and the Institute and all the work that you're doing. It's been so great spending this time with you. Thank you. No, thanks, man. I appreciate you having me on your show. And yeah, I mean, all the best for you and what it is that you guys do. I think it's wonderful. Mm. We're going to be sharing um, contact details for Herman, links where you can find and connect with him and his work, all in the description below. If you haven't yet subscribed to episodes, please do so. There's more to come. Um, I'll catch you in the next one.